This morning we're reading again from the book of Romans, chapter 1. And we're going to begin to read with uh, verse 15. Romans, chapter 1, verse 15. So much as, as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation unto everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Shall we move over to Romans chapter 2, verse 17? Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Uh, thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. What advantage then has the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Shall we move over to verse 9 of chapter 3? What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And then verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. May God add a rich blessing to the reading of his own Holy, Spirit, uh, Holy Word this morning. We began last week with Paul ministering to the Gentile nations, that uh, helping them to recognize that they need the gospel, that the wrath of God is 
revealed from heaven against all ungodliness uh, and righteousness, unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And this morning, Paul declares that he's ready to preach the gospel to both Jew and Gentile. And the purpose is that he may be able to impart some uh, spiritual gift to them that they might become established in the faith. And, of course, he reminds them that he is not ashamed of the gospel, uh, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Now, Paul himself could testify this uh, because he knew the power of God. Paul experienced the power of God himself. He experienced it when he was on the Damascus Road. That uh, before his conversion uh, on the Damascus Road, he was going about uh, to establish his own righteousness, which was based upon the righteousness of the law. Uh, there's another place in the scripture where he calls it the Jews' religion. Now, in writing, he describes his life before his conversion, that he was a blasphemer, uh, that he was injurious, uh, he was a persecutor of the church, uh, he was going about seeking and putting people of faith in prison. He declares himself to be the chiefest among all sinners. But on the Damascus Road, he had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, and he became a new creature in Christ Jesus. His testimony became, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He said, I am crucified with Christ, and nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul became a changed man. In one transaction, one meeting with the Lord on the Damascus Road that changed his life forever. And his testimony was that all the former things that were gained to him, his genealogy as an Israelite, uh, belonging to the tribe of Benjamin, his great education that he had under one of the chiefest and best educators of the time by the name of Gamaliel, his religion of being a Pharisee of the most strictest sect. He says, I count them all loss for Christ. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, that I might be found in him, not having my own righteousness, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Paul experienced the forgiveness of sins. He experienced peace with God. He experienced the assurance of salvation, the security of the righteousness of God imputed and imparted to him 
and not only to him, but to all who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The power of God, the power of the gospel, had changed him from the vilest of sinners to be the chiefest of the apostles by the experience of conversion and the calling of God. Now, this man Paul, he was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And as he traveled through Gentile, the Gentile nations, he noted their condition. Ungodliness, unrighteousness, in men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I, I think it's a very significant thing he says to the Gentiles. He said, you know better. You don't walk in the way that you know which is better. Then he, the reading this morning, when he's speaking to the Jews, he said, you are a people who know his will. But they don't do it either. And the scripture reminds us when he was speaking of the Gentiles, it says when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. In fact, he goes on to say that they dishonored him, changing the image of God into the image of birds and beasts and reptiles and so forth. Um, they refused to walk in the light that they had. They refused to worship God and, and so forth until they came to the place that they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And so God gave them up to a reprobate mind, a mind hardened in sin, to the uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to vile affections, to dishonor their own bodies, and doing those things which are unnatural. He saw the Gentile nations wholly given up to idolatry. And as a result, they were filled with all kinds of unrighteousness. I have been in some of those nations that's like that. And where you have idolatry, idol worship, it's always accompanied by prostitution and immorality, where men will do the vilest of all things. And it is to this condition that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And in spite of this condition of the Gentile nations, the Gentile nations have been ruling the world since the days of Nebuchadnezzar, a period of over 2,600 years ago, known in the scriptures as the times of the Gentiles. And the times of the Gentiles were reminded in the scriptures because of their wickedness uh, that it, their times will conclude with a time of judgment in the battle of Armageddon that will be a judgment of the nations. That the 
Gentile nations today as we know it, know them, that the cup of iniquity is filling. And when the cup of iniquity has become full, the wrath of God will be released. And this morning we're not going to consider all these various things that is going to be perpetuated and come to the full. You can read them yourself in uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 29 through 31. And in our generation today, which is a short period of time in Gentile history, we see an explosion and an intensity of these great sins of mankind, not only in their rebellion and rejection against God, but in their state of unholiness and unrighteousness in perpetual sin, becoming what Paul calls in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that evil men waxing worse and worse. And of course, when this condition begins to take place, there is no fear of God. Now, the Bible tells us concerning this particular time of judgment, it says in the book of Revelation, in righteousness, the 19th chapter, in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes are a flame of fire. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations, that he will tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of all mighty God, and the blood of men will flow down the Megiddo Valley to the depth of the horse's bridles for 186 miles. A time of judgment is coming for the Gentile nations because of their rejection of God's plan of salvation. And we see this rise today of persecution of those who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We see a rejection of the gospel even in some of our churches today. We see a rise of apostasy within the Christian community. But Paul reminds the world that God sent his Son into the world to enlighten the Gentiles that the people who sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. And that light that came into the world is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the light of the world. And of course, when we're talking about the world here, we're not talking about the universe. He said, I am the light of mankind. I have come to bring light to mankind, not just merely to the Jewish people, but light to all mankind. I am come to bring the light, the light of the world. And it was Peter who brought the glorious light of the gospel to the Gentiles. Ten years after the day of Pentecost, in the house of Cornelius, the Roman centurion. And it is this gospel of salvation 
that is to be preached in all the world, teaching all nations to observe all things whatsoever that he has commanded us. And what are the things that he has commanded us? They are written in the Gospels. They are written in the Epistles. And they are written to the nations of the world. And we are reminded that neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We have movements in the world today that are propagating that there are many ways to heaven. Some people have the concept that all men are going to heaven. Jesus said that that is not true. He said that straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. But few there be that find it. For broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to destruction. That there will be many will come in the last day and say, Lord, Lord, haven't we done this and haven't we done that? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. The Bible says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And Paul writing to Timothy, he writes, the Lord knows them that are his. He knows them because of his Spirit dwelling in their hearts. He knows them by the seal of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. And he knows that they are one of his own. One who has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. One whose sins have been washed away. One who is clean and pure and righteous in the sight of Almighty God. And the Bible calls them saints. Now, we need to recognize to reject Christ is to reject God. I'm noticing today that we got a lot of people talking about God, but they don't talk about Christ. And Christ is our medium to God. We cannot come to God apart from Jesus Christ. Because our sin and the blackness of the character of our nature separates us from a holy God, and the Bible calls us children of disobedience, children of wrath, that we stand outside of the covenants and the promises of God. To reject Christ is to reject the hope of eternal life. The Bible makes it very clear in John chapter 3 and in verse 36, it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. We find in uh, 1 John uh, chapter uh, 5 and uh, in uh, verse uh, uh, 10, it says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He knows he is a Christian. He is not hoping, he is not wishing, he is not thinking. He knows. 
Paul says, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The Apostle John says, These things have I written unto you that you might know that you have eternal life. He writes, we know we have passed from death unto life. Well, he's got the witness in himself. He that believeth not God, that is, if you don't believe the word of God, you've made God a liar. Because he believes not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. There is no eternal life apart from Jesus Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The person who rejects a personal encounter with Jesus Christ does not possess eternal life, and he has no hope of ever entering the kingdom of God. Now, Paul in writing to the Gentile churches, admonishes Gentile believers not to walk and not to live like other Gentiles in unrighteousness. Now, I believe that this is very important today because we are Gentiles. We're not Jews, we're Gentiles. And we live in a Gentile nation, in a Gentile society. We are Gentiles who have been saved by the grace of God, and we have now entered a third group of people dwelling on the earth. There is Jew, Gentile, and the Christians, the church, the body of Christ. And so once we leave this area of the Gentiles, we're no longer Gentiles, we're Christians. We belong to the church. Now, he says, when you belong to the church, no longer live like the Gentiles. And we're going to look at that this morning, because... This affects us because we live in a Gentile society. We need to realize today that we're not really living in a society of faith. We're living in a society of great unbelief, great resistance to the gospel, resistance to the power of God. Now, let us Look this morning at Second Corinthians. In the book of Second Corinthians in chapter six. Second Corinthians chapter six. And we want to look at verse fourteen. Paul writing to the Corinthian church, and of course this is a Gentile church. In fact, all the churches in the scriptures are Gentile churches except Hebrews. The Hebrews is a Jewish church. And you'll notice that as you're reading through the epistles, that the book of Hebrews is different from all of the other epistles. And the reason it's different is because Paul goes back and he deals with all the sacrifices and the temples, and the, whole for, uh, and the whole issue that the Jews had to deal with. You and I don't deal with those things. But the other churches are all Gentile churches, and they're very applicable to us. Let's look at the 14th verse. Notice what he says. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And when he's talking about unbelievers here, he's talking about the heathen. People today don't like to be called heathen, but if they're outside of Christ, that's what they are. They're heathen. They're unevangelized. They're heathen. They're Gentiles. 
Be not unequally yoked together with them, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? There can be a friendship, but there ought not be a fellowship. And there's difference between friendship, fellowship, and communion. They're not of the same mind, not of the same spirit, not of the same God. There is, there's, cannot be a relationship. And we're finding that in our day. That we have Christians bearing unbelievers and then they wonder why, why their marriage falls apart. Because they're not of one spirit, they're not of one mind, they're not of one accord, their interests are different, their habits are different, their nature is different, they don't belong together. Paul is warning these Gentile believers at Corinth, don't become involved with this kind of things for what communion has light with dirt. And what concord has Christ with Belial? Who's Belial? That's another name for the devil. What relationship is Christ with the devil? And what part has he that believeth with an infidel? An infidel is an unbeliever, an atheist, an agnostic. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate. Be who you're supposed to be. Be a Christian. Be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, my sheep know my voice, and they follow me. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Filthiness of the flesh and spirit belongs to the Gentiles. But perfecting holiness in the fear of God belongs to Christians. Let's go to the book of Ephesians this morning. And Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, we want to consider verse 11. Wherefore, remember, and this is talking to Ephesian believers, Gentile believers in Ephesus. Remember that you being in time past Gentiles, and you'll notice that the Apostle Paul now does not remember them, or expect them, or talk about them as being Gentiles. He says, you remember when you were Gentiles in the flesh, who is called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, as strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, we are without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you sometimes, you who are sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. He says, remember that you have left that. Let's move over into chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, 
who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness and to work all uncleanness with greediness. And lasciviousness is continual, lustful living. He says, but you have not so learned Christ. He says, God has called you out of that. You don't belong there anymore. You have left that society. Come out from among them and be separate. Have your identity with Christ. That you are a Christian that you're separate, you're distinct, that you're different. Let's turn to the book of Colossians. Now Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. Let's look at Colossians uh, chapter 3. And we're going to look at verse 5. He says, mortify your members which are upon the earth. And he says, these are certain things that you had before that now needs to be got rid of. Fornication. Fornication. That is a big issue today in the Christian church. Fornication. And fornication has to do with such things as lasciviousness, concupiscence, immorality. He said, this belongs to the Gentiles. This is the way you lived. Uncleanness. And uncleanness is vile affections. Dishonoring your bodies. Inordinate affections. And that inordinate affections is the changing of sexes. Men acting like women and women acting like men. Evil concupiscence, and you'll notice it says it's evil. And that evil concupiscence is inciting sexual appetites. And covetous, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. In which you also walked sometime when you lived in them. You notice what he's saying. He says, this is a Gentile practice. This is the way the Gentiles live. And he said, you used to live that way too. But now he goes on. But now you also put off all these. Ra anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. You know what that's talking about? Telling dirty jokes. Lie not one to another. He said, this don't belong. And you'll notice what he says here. Seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him after the image of God. You have a new image to live up to. The image of Christ. You are a Christian. These things do not belong in the life of a Christian. Where there is neither Greek or Gentile, nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, scythe, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. 
Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, do also ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which you are also called one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. You know it's a different life? There's a difference between being a Gentile and being a Christian. In our Gentile society, we find it very hard to discern the difference between the Gentiles and the Christians. And as a result of that, the glorious light of the gospel becomes defiled. And we read this morning that the Gentile nations blaspheme God because of the bad behavior of the Jews. And today we have the Gentiles are blaspheming God because of the bad behavior of the Christian church. Let's go to the book of Thessalonians. Called out to be separate. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God night and day, praying exceedingly that you might see, uh, that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one to another. And toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus." And this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. And that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go on, go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified, no more crooked dealings. No more crooked dealings. But God has not called us unto uncleanness but unto holiness, separation, to be different. We're different. We don't do that. We dishonor God. We dishonor the Christian gospel. We dishonor the Christian brothers and sisters. And we bring shame on the Christian community. 
And you and I know by experience that we have encountered such people. And they will tell us that if those people think they're going to heaven, we're just as good as they are, and we don't do the things that they do. And they don't realize we don't go to heaven by what we do. We go to heaven because we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But it is a poor testimony amongst the Gentile community in which we live. We're not called to be Gentiles. We've been called from being Gentiles to being Christians. Now, we need to be careful how we live. Because we do live in a territory where we are epistles known and read of men. They may not read their Bibles, but they read our lives. And that we need to be careful that we don't walk in the vanity of our minds, nor to seek the things which the Gentiles seek. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 31. Therefore take no thought, saying what we shall eat, or what we shall drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Paul writing to the Philippians, he said, Be careful for nothing, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests known unto God, and the peace of God shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. And we need to recognize today that multitudes of Christians are as greedy of the things of this world as the Gentiles themselves. How much land do we need? How big a house do we need? How much of this world's goods do we actually need? How is it being balanced with seeking the kingdom of God and His righteousness? How many times do we become anxious about things rather than backing off and trusting the Lord? And we're confronted with the fact, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Our God has promised to supply all our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He has nowhere promised to supply our greed, but he has promised to supply our need. 
And Paul reminds us the just shall live by faith. It is the justified who lives by faith. For we have a God this morning who is just and he is the justifier of them which believe in Jesus Christ. And today as Gentiles that has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, we have been called out of this world of ungodliness and unrighteousness, separated unto the gospel of God. That's what the whole book of Romans is about being separated unto the gospel of God. And that being separated unto the gospel of God is being separated unto a life of faith in Jesus Christ. I like the grand old hymn that sings, All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask besides? We have a great God. Paul makes his point that the Gentile nations live in a state of ungodliness and unrighteousness and that they are in need of the gospel to make them wise unto salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why this morning that the Lord has commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations of the world with the promise that everyone who believes can inherit eternal life and they will not come under the damnation of God nor fall under the wrath of God. We're reminded as believers that we take on a new role of followers of the Lord Jesus Christ executing his righteousness and his life into our lives and that we in turn are to be turning from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And when did he deliver us? The moment we believed. The moment we believed. We were delivered from the sentence of death. For it is the law of the life in Christ Jesus that has made us free from the law of sin and death. And this is what Paul relates to the Roman church. And he relates to them the futility of trying to be saved by works. For he says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you and I walk in the flesh, we're going to live like the Gentiles. If we're going to live in the Spirit, 
we're going to live like Christ. It is a spiritual walk of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal way and allowing Him to transform us and regenerate us and conform us to His image that His mind will be in us so that God can highly exalt us and give us a name which is above every name that is named in heaven and earth. And that name is the name of Jesus Christ. It is stamped upon our lives. And this morning, Paul, in writing to the Roman church, he is calling them to a life of separation and holiness out of a life of ungodliness, unrighteousness, and away from the wrath of God into the glorious presence of the living God. Jesus Christ is the door into that life. Shall we pray? Father, today, how grateful we are this morning to know that we have passed over the dividing line, that we're no longer considered Jew or Gentile, but we're considered to be temples of the living God, the habitation of God, people in whom God is pleased to dwell in their midst, to forgive sins, cleanse from all unrighteousness, deliver from evil, and separate us unto himself as vessels of honor. Our God, we rejoice in thy presence today, O God. We're not worthy of the least of your mercies, and yet you have bestowed grace upon grace upon grace, grace that is greater than all of our sins, that now we can honestly say, that sin has no more dominion under, over us because we're under grace. And we can come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find the grace to help in living out our Christian life. And our Father, I pray today that this word of the Lord, the Spirit of God, would write it upon our hearts, that we will not quickly forget it or the enemy steal it out of our hearts. Father, I thank you, our God, today for the word of God that directs us into the ways of everlasting life through your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray today. Amen.